Hi, this is Amy from the Alti store. Well, what can I say? Mother Nature seems really mad lately. Natural disasters like we've never seen before are happening more frequently. Meanwhile, the electrical grid infrastructure is taking quite a beating. As a result, more and more people who have installed grid-tied solar to reduce their electric bills and their carbon footprint are finding themselves without power for days, just like their non-solar neighbors. Some people didn't realize that grid-tied solar is required to shut down when the grid goes out, even during a sunny day, to protect the line workers repairing the grid. Some did realize it, but they found that they're losing the grid more and more frequently and for longer periods of time. So is it too late for them to add backup to their solar system? No. There are options, depending on what type of grid-tied inverter they use. Most of them require adding a battery bank and a second inverter. Two of the most popular options are AC and DC coupling. Let's discuss them one at a time. AC coupling adds a battery-based inverter that connects between the grid-tied inverter and the grid. You would add a new critical loads panel, which is a breaker box where you connect everything that you need to remain on during an outage, like your fridge, well pump, furnace blower, some outlets for some lights and phones, and maybe even your laptop and network router, depending on how widespread the outage is. The basics for food, water, heat, and communications. When the grid is up, the new battery-based inverter's internal transfer switch allows the grid-tied inverter's solar power to just pass right through and be connected to the grid, same as usual. Since a grid-tied inverter needs to see a good, stable power from the grid to stay on, it's happy. It sees the grid power all is well. Everything in both your main breaker box and your new critical load panels gets power from the grid. Meanwhile, the new battery-based inverter is making sure that the battery bank is all nicely charged, ready to go when needed. You're making solar power, everyone's happy. But when the grid is down, the new inverter's internal transfer switch disconnects the whole system from the grid as it's supposed to do. Instead, it draws energy from the new battery bank and sends nice clean power to the critical loads panel. So you have your lights, well, fridge, everything you need running off the battery bank. But what about your solar? What happens when the sun comes out before the grid comes up? Here's the cool part. Because the grid-tied inverter is also connected to the output of the battery-based inverter, it sees the power coming out of that new inverter. It checks it out. Right voltage? Check. Right frequency? Check. Up and stable for at least five minutes? Check. Cool, it says to itself, the grid is up, I can turn on. So it does, which is perfectly fine because the new inverter has disconnected everything from the grid. You are now acting as a 100% code compliant off-grid solar system. Your non-critical loads are off. Sorry, no hot tubbing for you. Your appliances in your critical loads panel are using any power generated from the solar panels and any extra power is going backwards through the new inverter to charge up the battery bank. So, let's go over the pros and cons of this solution. Pros. It doesn't require any rewiring of your solar system up to the breaker boxes. Any changes are made at the output of the inverter on the AC side. All of your DC wiring remains unchanged. For a microinverter system, Unless the microinverter company has their own battery solution, this is pretty much your only choice. You can choose to use all or just some of your microinverters in your AC coupled system. Likewise, with a system that uses DC optimizers, like SolarEdge, unless you're using their storage solution, which we did another video on, AC coupling is your best option because you can't disconnect the optimizers from the inverter, you can only change around the output of the inverter. So cons. Depending on which battery-based inverter you use, they have different methods for making sure the batteries don't get overcharged with the setup. This is a concern because the solar power is being backfed through the output of the inverter, not through the input of the charger that's designed to safely manage the battery charging. Some inverters shift their output frequency when they sense the battery bank is full, so that when your grid-tied inverter is always checking that the grid is within the approved voltage and frequency window, 
it will sense something is amiss and will shut off, giving your loads time to use up some of the energy from the full battery bank. Once the battery bank drops to an appropriate level, the frequency goes back to normal, the grid tight inverter waits for five minutes, and then turns back on. Other inverters simply send a signal to a relay that opens and disconnects the grid tight inverter until the battery voltage is acceptable. So while neither is the best method for charging the battery bank, it is better than nothing. Secondly, the new battery-based inverter needs to be at least a little bit bigger than the grid tight inverter, sometimes about 20%. As a result, this is not a great solution for people with very large grid tight inverters because you'll need a new inverter that's bigger than you need. Even with smaller inverters, because you need to send the full output of the grid tight inverter to the battery, in order to prevent sending too much current to the battery bank and damaging the batteries, you may need a bigger battery bank than you really need, costing you even more money. For example, if you have a 5,000 watt grid tight inverter and your battery bank doesn't want to be charged at more than a C6 rate, which is the amp hours divided by the charging amps, you'll need at least a 600 amp hour 48 volt battery bank, whether your loads need that much or not. That's about $7,000 of AGM batteries. We'll talk more about this later. Another con is that not all grid tight inverters are that easy to trick into turning on. For example, Fronius inverters are known to not work well with AC coupling. Take a look at this page to see an AC coupling solution for a better understanding of what equipment's needed. Okay, so if you don't have microinverters or a solar edge, or you have a Fronius or a large string inverter, what other options do you have? I'm glad you asked. DC coupling might be right for you. With DC coupling, you still have to add a critical loads panel, a battery-based inverter, and a battery bank. But instead of sending the whole output of the grid tight inverter to the battery inverter, you leave it where it is in the main breaker box. Instead, with DC coupling, you take one of the DC strings of the solar array and send it through a switch to a new 600 volt MPPT charge controller to safely and efficiently charge your battery bank. So, when the grid is up, the switch is sending all of the solar power to the grid tight inverter, same as usual. The new battery based inverter charger is using the AC power to keep the battery bank charged up. Most likely it's the AC power you're making with your solar array, but if it's not sunny, it will use the grid. Everyone's happy. When the grid goes out, the grid tight inverter disconnects itself from the grid, same as it does now. The battery based inverter turns on and powers up your critical loads from the battery bank. You can then physically turn the switch to redirect one string of your solar array to the charge controller to charge up the battery bank from the solar panels. That's what charge controllers are meant to do. You get a healthy multi-stage charging of your battery bank that your battery-based inverter can use to keep your lights on. Okay, same game. Let's go over the pros and cons of DC coupling. Pros. Because the charge controller is designed to handle a string up to 600 volts, just like your grid tight inverter, you don't have to rewire the PV string you leave it as the high voltage to allow for low current from the array. Although if you are combining the strings at the solar array, you may need to break them out to two strings. If you have a large grid tight inverter, because it is just using one string of the solar array, you're sending less current to the battery bank, so you can do a smaller bank if your loads allow. Using that same example of 5000 watt grid tight inverter, if you have two strings going to the inverter, you can switch just one of them 2,500 watts to the charge controller. That's only 52 amps to the battery bank, so you can safely have a 300 amp hour battery bank. That's half the size that's required for AC coupling, or half the money at $3,500. Let's think about that battery bank size. 300 amp hours at 48 volts is 14.4 kilowatt hour battery bank. If it's AGM, you're only gonna be using 50% of that energy for 50% depth of discharge, that's around seven kilowatt hour of usable stored energy. You would easily be able to back up a fridge, well pump, lights, laptop router, and occasionally run your gas or oil furnace, just enough to keep from freezing, or run a fan to help keep cool. Also, because you're doing a smaller backup, 
you can save money with a smaller inverter charger. Cons. Because DC coupling adds a new 600 volt charge controller to the system, which can cost well over $1,000, as well as the new inverter and battery bank, the equipment cost can be higher than AC coupling that does not require the new MPPT charge controller. But as we discussed, that cost can be offset by allowing you to have a smaller battery bank and inverter charger. So overall, this can be a less expensive option, depending on the battery bank. So it could potentially be a pro rather than a con, depending on your design. Also, as we said in the pros of the AC coupling, DC coupling is only an option for grid-tied systems that have DC running to a string inverter. It cannot be used with microinverters or DC optimizers like SolarEdge. Check out this example of a DC coupled kit for more details. Now note that neither AC nor DC coupling options would really be enough to run an electric heater or an air conditioner for long, but that's a topic for another video. I hope this was helpful. If so, give us a like and a share, and be sure to check out more of our videos. Also go to our website at altistore.com, where we've been making renewable doable since 1999.